How many people have had a flying dream where you, it's like full color and you're flying along? All right, that's your astral body. And the mystics call it your astral body. But it's actually part, it's, it's part and parcel woven into your physical body, but you can have experiences where it separates. Um, and you can travel through that modality. So other places, other dimensions. And um, this has been done for thousands of years. There's many, many accounts in the literature about people doing this. And many people will confuse that with their actual physical body because it, it looks very similar in shape and size. But then within that astral body is the sort of the, the essence of your, your self, your thought essence. And then within that is pure consciousness. So if you look at it, every single individual human being has folded within them all the dimensions of the cosmos. So when people say, how do I explore and find these other dimensions? I said, they're already folded within you. They're there. It's just that we're, you just need to have someone explain that that's what that is. Um, so anyway, so this uh, military, this Skunk Works guy, the Lockheed Skunk Works, was very happy to finally figure out <laughs> what happened. But then we had this discussion, and I said, you know, this has you know, really profound implications for you understanding what's going on at Dreamland MOC. And you know what Dreamland MOC is? Uh, Dream, okay, so it's inter I, have, I brought with me the, the thing I put together when Obama got elected. And the very first document in this, uh, this briefing is the one from Nellis Air Force Base, you know, what the public call Area 51. Nobody calls it that. And it talks about the Dreamland MOC in it, Dreamland, and uh, all the different, different compartments uh, out at that facility. And the reason there was an area called Dreamland is that when the pilots who were piloting these anti-gravity devices, and they were taking them to the edge of the crossing point of light, all right, to the, right to the edge of going beyond the light barrier, resonantly. There is this phenomenon of beginning to dematerialize, and you find that you have shifted your body and the craft and everything in it, and it feels like a lucid dream, when you're awake in a lucid dream. And that's why it was called Dreamland, Military Operating Center, MOC. And a lot of people always wonder how they got Dreamland. Uh, so the, now you know, and, but the, this is something that if you begin to look at, if you do an ethnography of different cultures, for example, the aboriginals in Australia, where they have something called dream time. And I know a man who worked for ONI, the Office of Naval Intelligence and State Department. His cover was State Department, it was really ONI. Um, and he went over there to study this. And so he went out to the outback, this was back in the 70s, I think. And he kind of embedded himself with a group of aboriginals who were still in touch with that ability. And they were talking to him about dreams. So, you know, one night they, you know, were in some encampment and they were very nomadic, went to sleep. And one of the members of, of the tribe, uh, one of the aboriginals uh, the next morning said, oh, well, I had uh, a very lucid, in, in the dream, I met uh, some, uh, so-and-so, I don't know the person's name, and we're going to, we need to walk da 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 and meet at whatever time here. And of course this guy who was a State Department slash Naval Intelligence person studying this weird high strangeness uh, didn't quite believe it. And so they started trekking, trekking, trekking. And sure enough, at the exact place and time, they, he met this person who, and they didn't have cell phones, nothing. And they just met. And he said, this is, you know. So, it was one of these things where this is their normal state. And many African tribes have, have, will have described doing this, and Native American peoples, and you know, they, they call them seers or visionaries. But it's really this, just the capability of the conscious mind to be disciplined to in the dream state, wake, the sleep state, to awaken into this dream, and then be in control while you're having it. That's the lucid part, and begin to explore and you can explore things in this world or other worlds that way. Now really what we do when we do the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind protocols is that we're going into deep meditation and doing it consciously. You know, we're not going to sleep. Well, some people go to sleep because we're out till two in the morning. But 
we're doing this uh, through a technique, a meditative technique and a protocol, which you, know, you can all um, uh, use and, and practice. And practice makes perfect, I'll tell you. You need to practice it for it to really work effectively. But the concept is what you need to understand. How does it work? Well, if you're talking about connecting to an interstellar civilization, they may or may not be in the area and not in this linear dimension. Maybe they're dematerialized and they're hovering over the White House. Could be. Why not? Who would detect it? Nobody would detect it if it shifted far enough out of this dimension. But it could pop into view instantly. So it's not just that they're traveling faster than the speed of light. They can be shifted beyond the speed of light and be, quote, stationary, but kind of superimposed around this space, but beyond 3D space. Does that make sense? So it could be in this room. It could be anywhere. Now, the effect, it becomes something that doesn't make a lot of sense to people unless they understand the, the basics, basic concepts I'm, I'm sharing now. And then you say, well, what happens when it's only partially here? So let's say there's a spacecraft, and it's not quite... 3D, but it's near, but it's shifting, it's bumping up against the fabric of space-time. Well, this is where you get all kinds of epiphenomenon, all kinds of other phenomena, such as electromagnetic signals coming through our systems that we detect, um, a sphere that floats right by us out in the desert, which happened to Joshua Tree a few years ago, stopped and we heard four voices speaking in the desert, in clear air, empty, we had night scopes. And then all of a sudden we took a photograph and here's this extraterrestrial we call Bijou, who's from the Andromeda galaxy, who's there waving. It's on the website, okay? That's how that happened. But it actually, so the, the understanding of this, it's really, key to going out and doing the contact protocols. Because you're using consciousness, but you're also using thought and electromagnetic systems, and all of this is coming together in a nexus. And there can be all degrees of the manifestation or how something materializes. It can be 3D, where you really would bump into it solid, or it may look like it's 3D, but you could walk right through it. Wonderful story from Altus uh, Air Force Base, a friend of ours who lives out in the mountains. He worked for the Air Force back in the 60s, and he was a guard at a nuclear bomb squadron out in Oklahoma. And if you read his account, it's very interesting because there was a roughly a chevron or triangular-shaped object that was cobalt blue, gorgeous, that came into, and they were investigating our uh, nuclear capabilities. I think this was in 1968. I have to look it up. Uh, but it's in the testimony. You can look. But what was interesting is that he said it was translucent cobalt blue. It wasn't solid. But you see the shape of it, but it wasn't fully like that. Does that make sense? So it moved over, and of course they have what they call the hot areas that are marked off in red. No one can go into those hot areas except the, the pilots for the nuclear uh, bombers. And of course, these were hot, ready to go. They were kept ready to go all the time uh, in those days. Um, and we still have some that are hot, ready to go. But the hot areas were, and they had sensors, electromagnetic sensors. Well, as this thing moved across that area, it set the sensors off. So even though it wasn't 3D, totally physical, it, visually you could see this outline of this cobalt blue ship. And it was enough in this dimension to put off electromagnetic fields that the electronic sensors went off, which ended up being a disaster because they went to a full alert and had to scramble those jets and move them off the base, which is what happened. But the craft was never 3D, fully 3D. Does this make sense? So many times people will see something and they'll go, well, I saw it, but I'm not sure. And in fact, that's how this guy approached me. I'm not sure what I, and I said, well, just describe it. Don't editorialize it. And he described it. I said, oh, well, I know exactly what that is. That was a craft of that shape and dimension 
that was still shifted, its molecular and atomic structure resonant field was still shifted high enough that it wasn't totally 3D, but you could see the glow and outline of it, kind of like an astral body or a ghost. Cool stuff, huh? Is this too much information too quickly? Okay, so um, we're going to have a whole hour and a half of question and answer for later anyway, so make notes on your little tablets or whatever you want to do if you have questions that come to your mind. The reality is when we're observing ETs, their physical bodies can also do the same thing. So if you look at this ET we call Bijou that, that appeared at uh, Joshua Tree National Park, we're probably going to do a, a week training there in April if you want to come. Uh, we go to this place that's amazing in the heart of this 800,000 acre park. And um, was that with the naked eye, nothing was seen. Now, the ears could hear four ETs speaking. I don't know what language they were speaking. Andromedan? I don't know. Um, but when the person took the photo, Raven, a member of our team, took the photo, she, she just held her breath and had the, it open for three or four seconds, and here is this glowing the field of energy and this being standing there, turned like this, waving at us. And on the top of his head, if you look very carefully, is what looks like a, a yarmulke. It's not, I don't think he's Jewish. Uh, it might be. Uh, he was a rabbi from Andromeda. No. But, uh, but it's this thick, it's about this, it looks about that thick, and it's a white, uh, and it's a, t basically a teleportation de assisting device. So it holds that field. So the f their physical body can phase in and out of 3D or 5D, 10D, whatever, resonantly shifting. Make sense? Uh, Try I'm looking around to see if I've lost everyone yet. Because uh, understanding all of this, I'm trying to give examples of things that are really big lessons to understand when you're going to go out into the stars with your team in Largo or wherever, or California or wherever you're from. Uh, now the other more fascinating part of this is that interstellar civilizations utilize what I call coherent thought, thought emanating from a deep level of quiet mind that's very directional, very specific, the way we would utilize a laser and a laser disc or a fiber optic system with lasers or, you know, a laser tracking system.